Welcome to the 2019 ALA Midwinter Presidential and Treasurer Candidates Forum. My name is Jim Neal. I am the ALA Immediate Past President, and I will be moderating this forum. Also with me on the platform is Ellie Mina, ALA's parliamentarian, who will serve as our official timekeeper. For the forum today, we have asked each candidate to give a five-minute presentation, which will be timed by our parliamentarian. After the candidates have given their presentation, the floor will be open for questions from you, the audience. We will ask audio, audience members to specify whether their question is directed to either the presidential or treasurer candidates or to both groups of candidates. All respective candidates will be given two minutes to respond to each question. The forum will end with each candidate presenting a two-minute statement or summary. The forum is being videotaped and will be posted to YouTube as soon as possible after the Midwinter Conference. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you the presidential and treasurer candidates for the 2019 election. The presidential candidates are Julius C. Jefferson, Jr. and Lance M. Werner. The treasurer, please. The treasurer candidates are Andrew K. Pace and Maggie Farrell. I will now ask presidential candidate Julius C. Jefferson, Jr. to present his opening statement. Julius. Thank you, Jim. And thank you to the nominating committee for the opportunity to stand as a candidate for president-elect of the American Library Association. Libraries are not just places where we work, but are the sentinels of our democracy, a place where lives are impacted and the ideals of our country are upheld. I'm reminded of this sentiment every day when I enter the James Madison Building of the Library of Congress, where I see the following inspiring quote inscribed, knowledge will forever govern, govern ignorance, and the people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. These are the words of James Madison, the father of our Constitution. I add that libraries or librarians and library workers are the keys that provide access to power. In an age when ignorance attempts to trump knowledge, it is an exciting time to be a member of the American Library Association. ALA can and will play an important role at this critical juncture in the history of our association and our country. To maximize our impact, our association must stand united and speak with one voice to advocate for the education for an informed citizenry, to promote freedom of expression and privacy, to overcome the constant threat of reduced funding for essential library programs, and to support information policies that seek to unite our country rather than policies that divide the communities that we serve, such as net neutrality. As your ALA president, my focus will be on improving the ALA brand by highlighting the most valued asset, which is you, the 58,000 committed members of the American Library Association. To be effective advocates, we must change the narrative of who we are, librarians and library workers ALA members that represent the brand are and need to be recognized as a diverse workforce that is technologically savvy, inclusive, innovative, and passionate about serving our communities. Our brand must reflect our commitment to providing equitable access to information, serving as cornerstones in our respective communities. We must strengthen relationships within our complex organizational structure thereby rebuilding our brand. We must address and solve critical issues that affect our sustained future as we focus on advocating for our core values by collaborating and communicating across the association and removing existing silos that create divisive walls. We are stronger when we speak with one voice. As your ALA president, I will strive to strengthen relationships with key library advocates by building on the grassroots approach, utilizing a national network of advocates. I will, I will 
strive to strengthen equity, diversity, and inclusion, not just in our association, but in the libraries where we work. Build a culture of, a culture of inclusion within our association by strengthening relationships between ALA divisions, roundtables, affiliates, so that all our members can find a home amongst our ranks. Build and strengthen relationships with our ALA chapters by creating a communication plan that allows chapter leaders and ALA staff to work together. Continue to advocate for our school librarians and those who offer specialized services to children and young adults by highlighting the valuable role they have in developing the foundation for critical thought and intellectual curiosity. And finally, recruit the next generation of library workers by introducing and exposing K through 12 students to the possibilities of a career in librarianship. I stand prepared to serve the members of ALA, providing leadership for a modern library association. And I ask for your vote for ALA president. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. <clears throat> Presidential candidate Lance M. Werner will now present his opening statement. Lance. Well, uh, thank you so much, and it is fantastic to be here today. Welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you're having a great conference. I know I am. I've really enjoyed speaking with everybody and getting to know what their concerns are and, and where they're coming from. I'm so honored to be with you here today and to be considered as a candidate for the presidency of the American Library Association. I want to tell you a little bit about what I bring to the table. I'm a second generation librarian. My mother was a school librarian. I have my Master's of Library and Information Science and a Juris Doctorate degree. I'm also the director of the Kent District Library in Western Michigan. I'm an attorney, please don't judge me, uh, was formerly a registered lobbyist and an administrative law judge. I recently completed a fellowship at the Michigan Political Leadership Program, and I've had the good folk, or fortune of traveling around the country and teaching people about advocacy, specifically uh, relationship-based informal advocacy. I ha I'm happy to tell you that you all have been advocating your entire lives and are experts. I think it's important to state that whenever I get a chance to stand behind a microphone. I'm the past president of the Michigan Library Association, a former chair of its legislative committee. And when I was there, we hired a new director, and her name was Gail Madziar. I worked with Gail to help her become the most successful director of the Michigan Library Association. Um, she accomplished more legislatively than all of her predecessors. I have the experience on dealing with new directors in a, in a positive way. I've had the good fortune of wearing a lot of hats in a lot of different types of libraries. I've worked in public libraries, I've worked in special libraries, and I've worked in academic libraries. Challenges faced by these types of libraries are not abstract to me. I bring this background. I know, I know what it's like to walk in your shoes, and it will inform the, my decision-making process. Being an attorney has been extremely helpful, as you might imagine, in my legislative and advocacy efforts. I was successful in working with the Kent County Tea Party to gain support and assistance with our KDL millage campaign. We won a 45% increase by the widest margin ever. This is all based on relationship-based advocacy. I've advocated and I testified in support of bills designed to protect libraries from losing budgetary money to tax capture in Michigan, resulting in an $8 million windfall for Michigan's public libraries. This bill package has been sought for 20 years by all of Michigan's taxing entities and the associations that represent them, and MLA got it done based with relationship-based advocacy. I'm currently a member of the ALA Policy Corps, representing libraries in D.C. as an advocate. And in order for us as libraries to remain relevant in this fast-paced world, we must be alert, agile, and move quickly. And kind of that's how I roll. The, world of, the role of leadership is to lead in a selfless, constructive way. I'm a servant leader. My role is to build the people up around me and to facilitate their greatness, because their greatness is our greatness. We all have the power to make ALA stronger than ever, and now, my friends, is the time to turn up the music and dance. As your ALA president, I'll be focused on a choreography for two basic steps. Step one is to make sure that member voices are heard and acted upon. And step two is to leverage our greatest, greatest, uh, our greatest assets, and that is kindness, empathy, and love. These characteristics are the core of what we do and do well. They uniquely position us for strategic partnership and advocacy efforts, and this is precisely what ALA can do on a national and international level. I firmly believe that the presidency is certainly not about the president. It's about setting the stage for the new director and the association to be wildly successful. Now is the time to turn up the music and dance, and as president of ALA, I will implement this shoe on the dance floor strategy. 
I am ready to do the hard work and to take the lead and to inspire others to do the same. I will accomplish this by leveraging my considerable advocacy background and experience and help with ALA training to, per, to help people employ more informal advocacy techniques for, inclu, uh, for inclusion for themselves and their profession, and also by engaging stakeholders from diverse backgrounds to gain guidance as, how ALA can more, as to how ALA can more effectively promote equity, diverse, diversity, and inclusion and provide better services to diverse communities. I think it's critical that we seek input from ALA members to explore answers to tough questions about the future of libraries. Change can only happen if we are willing to, to change and, and take charge. And as ALA president, I will focus on this for the benefit of libraries everywhere. Now is the time to turn up the music and dance. And thank you for coming today. And I appreciate your support for my candidacy. Candidacy. I now call upon treasurer candidate Andrew K. Pace to present his opening statement. Andrew. Thank you, Jim. Esteemed colleagues, I can't imagine a more exciting time in the association's history to stand before you as a candidate for ALA treasurer. I want to thank the nominating committee, the organizers of this event, and my worthy opponent, Maggie Farrell. All of you can look up my record of education and professional experience. Most of you should know me for my steadfast dedication to the governance of this association. More still, know my devotion to libraries, to our profession, and to those we serve. In our profession, attention to finances is often an anathema at worst, or a burden of doing business at best. Lucky for all of you, I'm a library-loving policy wonk who also loves spreadsheets. <laughs> yes, ALA's treasurer does all the things you might expect, but I've learned as a member of the executive board and the finance and audit committee that there's more to the job than just trying to balance the budget and keeping a watchful eye on the balance sheet. Of course, I will dedicate myself to ALA's financial success, but as an elected leader, being treasurer means making sure that ALA invests its assets in alignment with its key priorities. Advocacy, information policy, professional and leadership development, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. I will do this by stressing the same three principles used as a former division president, as an ALA counselor, and as an executive board member. Transparency, trust, and transformation. First, transparency. Previous treasurers have taken huge strides in making the financial workings of the organization more understandable. From annual budgets and long-term balance sheets to indirect cost rates and annual estimates of income. Your next treasurer will oversee the transition from an investment deficit budget to an even more sustainable financial model that balances the budget while investing in the association and the profession. My strong relationship with divisions, chapters, roundtables, committees, and affiliates as well as my working knowledge of council and the executive board will make ALA's finances and strategic directions even more accessible and transparent to the ALA membership. From me, members can always expect an open mind, direct communication, and candor, a reputation already firmly held. Second, trust. My career and volunteer experience have afforded me more financial experience than the average librarian. Throughout my career, I've endeavored to further business thinking and financial acumen in our profession. As a former endowment trustee and CFO of a large nonprofit once said to me, just because we're not for profit doesn't mean we're for loss. On the job, I've gained skill, the skills necessary to manage revenue budgets as high as $30 million. As a LIDA member and as, as its former president, I consulted with the LIDA board in 2015 regarding their financial future, creating their first budget review committee, and even urging LIDA to consider a merger with other divisions. I was also an advisor and founding member of ALA's 1876 Club, launched by the Development Office in 2017. At home, I'm a member of my church's 40-year-old foundation, managing one-time and long-term giving as a foundation trustee. I also believe that trust is both earned and discovered by dis devoting oneself to creating a more inclusive environment, both at our places of work and within, within the association. ALA has big strides left to make, and I'm committed to viewing our initiatives and ALA's finances through the required lens of EDI and social justice. Finally, transformation. You've heard our executive director and others, our treasurer, talk about ALA's streams of change. ALA membership, communications, governance, finances, IT infrastructure, staff, workspaces, and conferences are in a state of major transformation. And a year from now, the executive board will introduce you to a new executive director. I've been a key player in the major strategic discussions and the financial impact that comes with them. I have worked closely with the current ALA treasurer, three bark chairs, and ALA finance staff to ensure that budgets and investments 
are aligned with organizational strategy and aren't simply numbers on a page. And as a member of the Steering Committee on Organizational Effectiveness, SCOE, I've been a pragmatic voice for change. ALA faces an interesting paradox. On the one hand, ALA has suffered budget deficits in the wake of financial crisis, deprofessionalization from outside forces, and an organizational and member engagement structure that is rooted in 19th and 20th century governance models. On the other hand, ALA's outstanding balance sheet reflects both the value libraries bring to society and the profession, and a devoted membership that embraces 21st century focus, direction, and dedication. I honestly believe that ALA can successfully leverage its balance sheet to make investments in, de in the development office, in information technology, and in advocacy, the heart, body, and soul of this association, to ensure not only its short-term relevance, but also its long-term viability. I will bring the right mixture of prudence and prospecting, the right combination of experience and expedience. I will lead ALA's embrace of a transparent realism in its financial planning and reporting that supports our shared commitment to libraries, library workers, and the future of the association, while never compromising our core values. Transparency, trust, transformation. Thank you for your attention. I call upon Treasurer Candidate Maggie Farrell to present her opening statement. Maggie? Thank you, Jim. And thank you to all of you for attending this afternoon. This is such a great afternoon. The weather is, is warm. The sun is out during a fabulous conference. So I realize that you have choices and appreciate your interest in the leadership of ALA. And I want to say hello to our members who may be viewing this recording following the conference. Where do we start in talking about the issues facing our American Library Association and by extension, our profession? As librarians, we seem to face continual funding problems, the notion of irrelevancy in an internet world, overflow of communication, lack of diversity in our profession, and high expectations by our patrons. As well, we have high expectations by our members. And while I believe that ALA is the premier library association offering relevant professional development, networking, advocacy, not only for our members, but we support all librarians, all library workers, all libraries. Our members and potential members have a variety of options before them for professional development, engagement with colleagues, and advocacy. So our challenge is not just to meet the needs of our current members, but also to ensure that we're meeting the needs of a broader community and to separate our association in providing services and advocacy that is distinguished or unique from other associations or opportunities that broadens our membership. I believe the power of ALA is our advocacy and our voice on legislative and policy issues. Our leadership and education of the profession, including continuing education and professional development. Our power is our ability to increase diversity in librarianship. Our value, our power, is our value of equitable services and social justice. In these areas, we can have a significant impact for our communities. But to do so, we need an organization that fits our current society and how we work and communicate. We need a financial structure that supports our work and conferences, structures, and membership structures that are inclusive and efficient. We need pathways for leadership and personal development so that every member has a focus, so that uh, development for every member and a focus on diversifying librarianship. These are high goals for ALA and it's challenging to reimagine our current practices into a new model. But we see this transformation occurring in our very own libraries as we reinvent and adapt to the changing expectations of our patrons. I am confident that as the smart, creative, energized, optimistic librarians that we are, we can and will recast the structures of our association. 
So what do we need to focus on as an association? Of critical concern is the diversity of our profession, librarians and library workers. As a librarian at the most diverse university, a majority minority HSI university, it is a personal as well as a professional commitment. As treasurer, I would personally continue to support the financial support of our EDI initiatives. One of the streams of changes we have been discussing is examining the membership structure. Our structure is such that we actually may be preventing some librarians from joining and creating barriers for membership. As treasurer, I would not only support this examination, but would be working on the financial assessment for potential members. As you know, dues only make up 16% of our revenue, so changes are material, necessary, and we know the potential impacts. As treasurer, I would contribute to this conversation with strong expertise in organizational and financial management. I have been the dean at three large universities. I have also served on the ACRL, ACRL board as ALA counselor and currently on the budget analysis and review committee and am chair of BARC. Complementing my financial expertise are my leadership skills of openness, transparency, and clarity. Thank you for consideration of my candidacy. I want to thank you again for coming. I ask for your vote as treasurer. We will now take questions from the audience. This is the order in which we are going to proceed. Julius Jefferson will respond to the first question, then Lance Werner. If it involves a question directed also at the treasurer candidates, we will then proceed to Andrew Pace and then Maggie Farrell. For the second question, we will reverse that order. And for the third question, we'll make it possible for those who did not have an opportunity to speak first to respond to your question. If you wish to ask a question, please come to the nearest microphone. Please specify whether your question is for the presidential or the treasurer candidates or for all of the candidates. When you are recognized, please state your name and institution before asking your question. As I indicated at the outset, each individual candidate will be given up to two, two minutes. I encourage them to be more concise and brief, if possible, to maximize the number of questions that we can have at this session. Microphone five. Jennifer Bocher, Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Um, as libraries have increased the respect of communities, the membership in ALA has gone down. And so I'm wondering, as president, what will you do to increase the visibility of ALA and the benefits of being a member of ALA in your year? Membership. So I'm not sure that membership is going down, but I will say that two things that I want to do to increase membership. First of all, I'll, as I said earlier, I want to focus on the ALA brand, our asset. Uh, the greatest asset for ALA to increase membership are the members. We have to bring in individuals and let them know what great things that the American Library Association can do for them, especially new professionals, because new professionals come to the uh, association and may not understand that this body of individuals can help them on their career. The other thing that I want to focus on is recruitment. I want to recruit uh, a diverse workforce and let them know that once they become a uh, librarian, that we are going to be inclusive and have a home for them in our association. So I want to say that, remind you that we are the brand of the American Library Association, and we are the keys to increasing membership. I think it's a great question. I mean, we certainly do need to increase the visibility of the American Library Association and be able to demonstrate what the return on investment for membership is. And so I think it's really incumbent upon us 
to ensure that we are providing opportunities to new members and making membership something that is more attractive. I think we need to ensure that engaging with the association for a new member is something that's easy and nav navigable and they're not feeling lost and intimidated by this huge organization. So providing a roadmap and providing more opportunities for them to um, you know, apprentice and, and, and not apprentice, pardon me, do, do job shadowing, participate in activities and grow professionally are, are critical. I think we need to be more visible um, on campuses and I think that we really do need to be more visible even um, in, 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 in uh, grade schools and high schools and, and really let people know that librarianship is a viable career. We're not going anywhere. We've been around for 3,000 years. We're going to be around for 3,000 more. And uh, yeah, so I think we need to get out in front of people and let them know we're still here. Microphone number three. Eric Cease, counselor at large and director of the Marshall Public Library in Pocatello, Idaho. Uh, question directed to the treasurer candidates. You're both amazing. I, I'm really trying to figure out whether I need to decide who to vote for based on a coin flip. Um, given that, uh, could each of you please give me a, a short reason why you should be the person I vote for as opposed to your opponent, even though you both like each other? I'm going to remember that question, Eric. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, it, that's a really hard question to answer. Maggie and I uh, were, were talking the other night about this being a really collegial campaign for us and that uh, you're basically, when you're running for an office like this, you're, we're volunteering to spend even more of our time devoted to the association. And in my mind, that ought not to be a competition. Uh, because I, I really, I like that everyone spends time uh, in, in, in that effort. Uh, I, I will say that uh, my love for the financial aspects of ALA uh, is something that might distinguish me, uh, although Maggie is also bark chair, so again, I'm not sure if it's going to distinguish us too much. Um, also, it's where I prefer to spend the majority of my non-work time in the profession. Um, so lots of us have uh, various other places that we do, whether it's you know, Association of Research Libraries or Digital Library Federation or the myriad of other associations that are out there. I decided a long time ago to devote the majority of my time, the vast majority of my time, to the American Library Association. So, thanks. Eric, thank you for that question. And we're both kind of struggling with the answer on that. And I uh, want to repeat what Andrew has said. We have good choices in our leadership and appreciate all of the candidates and their willingness to serve. I would say I, I could talk about the, um, my financial experience. What has surprised me as a librarian is, uh, is once I've learned finances and managing the finances of my library, as well as in service opportunities, for instance, serving on the OCLC board as chair of the audit committee. I'm surprised at how much I like it and how good I am at it. But I want to stress another aspect. Since this is a leadership position, the financial aspects makes up, of course, a significant portion of the responsibilities. But as a leader, it's about uh, communicating with the membership. It's about um, attending to the goals, the strategic priority that council has and the executive board has. And as the BARC chair this year, we set forth goals for ourselves. And those goals are clarity, clarity in financial terms. What does overhead mean and how is it developed? Um, transparency in the work that we are doing. So we're trying to get more information out, not only to council, but to the membership. And finally, communication. So I've stressed the role of BARC liaisons in working with divisions and roundtables. The goal is to provide more information so that we can make sound decisions or we make choices knowing what those financial impacts are. And those are the skills I would bring as treasurer. Microphone number five. Thank you. My name is Mark Miller. I am the chairman of the Loudoun County, Virginia Library Board of Trustees. My question is for the presidential candidates. In the recent past, the American Library Association has taken positions on contentious political issues of the day that do not directly 
or in some cases even indirectly, focus on libraries and librarianship. Do you as president candidates believe that the, library, the American Library Association should or should not take positions on non-library or librarianship political issues, and if so, why or why not? Uh, my opinion about this is, no, the, the American Library Association shouldn't be taking positions on things that aren't related to libraries. I feel like, uh, going back to what I talked about earlier about advocacy, I think that we're all entitled to our own personal opinions about things, and I encourage people to vigorously oppose things personally when they come up, but I feel like the American Library Association needs to stick with things that are library related. Um, and I feel like by not doing that, we position ourselves to be ineffective in other areas. I think that, you know, it, it's something that can just snowball and go, you know, on and on and on. So I, I firmly believe that we shouldn't be taking issues on things that aren't directly library related. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's an interesting question. So having served on council for eight years, we've uh, debated, discussed many issues that certainly on the surface seem like they're not library related. But I believe that there are many issues that on the surface uh, seem that they're not library related, but they certainly have an effect on the communities that we serve that certainly are in our libraries. I think that it's a case by case basis and it depends. I think that we have a governing body um, that is equipped to be able to debate these issues, discuss these issues, and come up with some type of resolution, even if it's not something that's focused advocacy, but come, come up with a resolution that will at least state our position on certain issues. Microphone number two. Al Kagan, former CERT counselor. I have a question specifically for Mr. Werner, and I hope I heard this correctly. I think I heard you say that you work closely with the Tea Party, but I didn't hear you say that you worked with any other organizations. So why did you emphasize your work with the Tea Party? I kind of want to give you a hug right now. Um, because working with the Tea Party is like finding a unicorn. Uh, no one's been able to do it since. It really, I said, I bring that up because I feel like it really demonstrates the, my, uh, my advocacy skills. Um, I worked with everybody. Actually, I'm known in Michigan and across the county as, as representing everybody. I care about people. So when I was dealing with the Tea Party, what I did is didn't follow anybody else's advice, brought all my numbers to them, told them that this is what we're using our mill your, the millage money for, and this is what we need the additional money for, take it or leave it. And they were so stunned that I just was so transparent and honest, they, they didn't know what to do. So they actually went door to door for us in one of the municipalities. And I like to tell that story because it's kind of astounding. And then after that happened, other groups tried to go and uh, weren't able to do it, but they didn't have a relationship with people. I don't pay any attention when I'm in my public role to partisan beliefs, that's irrelevant to me. But, it's, it was important to, uh, for us to engage the enemy uh, kind of proactively, or quote unquote enemy, perceived enemy, and get them to either not come against us or help us out, because we didn't have money to fight off a counter campaign. Microphone number three. No, three. Okay. Thank you. Rivka Sass, Sacramento Public Library. Um, so I'm going to try to ask this question in a way that makes sense. Um, about membership and about priorities. Um, there are those people who believe that um, ALA is really an insider organization with an untenable governance structure. The council has something like 185 members, which makes it wonderful for inclusion but difficult to get real work done, and in the example I want to give is that within the last six weeks, two librarians have been murdered in the line of duty, one of them in my own library system. So how do we streamline the organization so that we address very real, very important societal issues as an organization 
with the nimbleness needed to actually get things done. And that's for our presidential candidates. Thank you, Rivka. Thank you for your question. So I think that that's where the association is going now. As I was uh, on the executive board, uh, we agreed that we would take a look at our whole association. Um, this is what the organizational effectiveness is about. Um, trying to see whether or not we have uh, the right governance structure to lead us in the future. So I think that how we get there is where we're going right now by having these open conversations of what's going to work best in terms of our, our governance structure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where we're going to be at the end of this. I think that certainly having 180 uh, counselors at large can be unwieldy, but I think somehow we seem to be able to agree on, it, on difficult issues. But I certainly look forward to, as, as your ALA president, continuing this conversation of the best governance structure for our association now. I think it's important to be brave enough to be critical of what's going on and be honest and figure out what works well and what doesn't work well and not be sentimental when facing these issues at all. I think it's important to get member input and ensure that members' desires are represented and if the association isn't able to react in a timely way to issues, and I'm sorry from the bottom of my heart for the things that happened to the two, two librarians in, in, uh, across the country and it's just it's heartbreaking. If we're not able to react in a way, then something, in the way, that need, then the way we need to be reacting, then something isn't right. I think we need to be able to confront that. I think we need to be honest about it and have the tough conversations to do the brave thing. You know, often, What's right isn't what's easy, and I think it's important to, to do what's right. So I think that as we go through this process and we're looking at how we operate, um, we just need to make sure it's done the right way that serves everybody and make those tough decisions. Thank you. Microphone number six. Peter Hepburn, College of the Canyon, Santa Clarita, California, and really glad to be on this side of the audience this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm asking a question on behalf of a colleague who was not able to be in the room today for the two presidential candidates. And she wanted to know what is the role of the American Library Association or the relationship of the American Library Association with the Me Too movement. And she specifically wanted to know um, about harassment of library workers, how ALA can help with that, and with the name Melville Dewey still being on awards in the American Library Association. I think the American Library Association needs to be a leader around the Me Too movement. I think all of us, especially work, well, in every library, I can tell you that the libraries I've worked at, this has been an issue everywhere. I think that we need to provide training. I think that we need to provide guidance as to how we can effectively deal with issues of sexual harassment. And uh, it just, it's disgusting. So I mean, the American Library Association can take the lead here and, and make sure that people are safe and strong by providing that guidance. And so I, I, I firmly believe that's something that's high priority and needs to be looked at immediately. Did I miss part of the question? I think that was it. Uh, so Peter, uh, thank you for your question. So yeah, absolutely. The American Library Association is already a leader in thinking about ethics. I mean, we, have, we have a committee on ethics and we talk about these type of things, what's ethical. And we also, just like when we come to the conference, we have a statement on appropriate conduct. I mean, we already are thinking about that. Sure, we, I, I believe we certainly can do more as we have more conversations. Um, we've had conversations about uh, the Wilder Award, and, we, we made, and, and that was at a, at a division level, and a decision was made. Um, I think we'll probably have conversations about the Dewey Award. Um, but these are not... Uh, decisions that, that are going to happen in a vacuum, we're going to have to have more conversation as we move forward. But I think we're heading down the, the right path. Microphone number five. Tamika Barnes, Georgia State University. One of ALA's um, strategic initiatives is equity, diversity, and an inclusion. And as somebody that's benefited from such programs being a 
1999 Spectrum Scholar. Can you tell me how you have supported EDI initiatives in the association in the past and what you plan to do in your president, presidential year? Tamika, that's directed at the president at candidate. Pres Thank you, Tamika. Thank you, Jim. Well, uh, straightforward, I, I've supported uh, the Spectrum Initiative, and, and you were a Spectrum Scholar, by donating to Spectrum. I think it's important that um, we certainly support the Spectrum initi Initiative, but certainly that's just a start, because Spectrum can only help a few individuals, a few individuals who have the opportunity to be selected. But it is a good start to be able to, to donate more money so more people can be uh, Spectrum Scholars. But in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion, I think that this is uh, a, a value that as uh, an executive board member, uh, I was for making a strategic direction because it is something that we are lacking in our profession, in our association. I mean, one of the things that I want to do is be able to make, that make us be an association that's inclusive an association that people feel comfortable being a part of any, anywhere they find a home in the association. I think that um, for equity, diversity, and inclusion, I'm going to make sure that I offer the support and the finances to continue the conversation of having uh, an equitable association and workforce. I think this area is of top priority. I really do believe that we need to double down and invest more heavily in it. And I think that it would be good to also get diversity training for, make that available to all libraries so they're aware of that. <clears throat> and even poverty simulations and things like that. Because I think the more awareness there is around this issue, the, the faster we're going to get it solved. So absolutely, um, I think as president, I would make a concerted effort, make one of my top priorities to ensure that the American Library Association becomes a standard for other associations around the issue of equity, diversion, or diversity, and inclusion. As far as the Spectrum Scholarship is concerned, I haven't had much contact with the American Library Association, so I haven't done much before. I've done things locally in my library and ensured that we have a, a workplace that, that embraces equity, diver, uh, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you. Um, we have about uh, five minutes left for questions. We're going to definitely take the three questions that are on the floor, and then we'll see where we stand. Microphone number three. Hi, Ann Eubank, uh, Montana State University, and this is a question for all four candidates. So um, in 10 years, in the event that you're elected, what will be the indelible mark that you leave on this association? Thank you. Thank you, Ann. That's a great question. So um, for as the treasurer, what I would hope is that we would have that infrastructure that is sustaining the organization, not only currently, but in the future, which means that we have some difficult choices that we likely need to make now that will be effective for the future. So for instance, I'll give you an example. This is the examination of our one of our greatest net assets is the building on Huron Street. And should we sell the building, we need to be wise about what we do with the proceeds of the building. And we are talking about a significant infusion of cash within our endowment that could help to sustain the activities that we have in the future. So I think um, as treasurer candidate, the mark that I would leave is that financial infrastructure decisions that we are making today have a long-term impact. In addition to that, we would be looking at our the diversity and how we um, invest our funds, as well as how those funds are being expended today, our, our membership dues, our revenue from conferences and publishing, and that we are not only supporting the activities today, but helping the profession to prepare for their future, and the association is supporting that development. So thank you. Thanks, Ann. 
Uh, I think a, 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 good, uh, a good mark would be uh, growth, continued growth year over year. I think a balanced budget would be a really good goal. But I really like to see a time when ALA is contributing money each year to the endowment on a more regular basis so that we can find other things to invest in uh, regard related to our, our core values. I think that uh, growth in membership and making uh, ALA an attractive uh, place to be. And then finally, I, I, would, I really hope as treasurer that we can, uh, and we've started some conversations on this already, but really have some metrics associated with the things that we're investing in. Uh, and if we can build that platform of metrics, then we can, we can ensure that there's a, the return on the investment is articulated back to the membership in a meaningful way. So that it's just not the numbers that you see up on the, up on the screen, but the direct tie of those numbers, the revenue and the investments, uh, to the things that are important to the membership and to the people we serve. I would hope that my legacy uh, included a number of different things, including strengthening infrastructure, um, ensuring that ALA sets the standard around equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, becomes an advocacy juggernaut. Um, there are more people that love libraries than guns. Um, there's no reason why we can't be as effective as the NRA is in Washington. We just have to get organized and get our message together. I think that we should work on streamlining communications to ensure that member voices are heard and acted upon. And I, I think that uh, everything, you know, decisions need to be member driven and we always need to keep in mind that we're providing a return on investment and an opportunity for new members so they can be successful in their profession and go far. I want to make sure that we're not making them feel disenfranchised. Thank you. So I hope certainly that in 10 years you look back and I see that we increased the membership significantly where if, if one becomes a librarian, they know that there's no other choice but to join the American Library Association because there's going to be a home for them here. That we are break down the silos across our association so we can be more effective, so we can collaborate and work together and we can be more effective in advocating for the issues that affect libraries. I hope that when I look back at my presidency as ALA, I think that this is the association that I wanted when I joined, and it's only going to get better from there. Microphone number six. Uh, John Mack Freeman, Gwinnett County Public Library. I'm also a member of the Georgia Library Association Executive Board, uh, and this is for the presidential candidates. What do you see as the state of the current relationship between ALA broadly and the state chapters? And what role do the state chapters have to play in any initiatives that you may put forward? So the, the cur I'm, currently I'm chair of chapter relations. And um, I think that, and I've been a, the president of a, a state chapter, actually a city, the District of Columbia Library Association. And I think that what we lack between the American Library Association and the chapters is a robust communication plan. I believe that we, we are not communicating well enough to be able to effectively support advocacy on the, the, in the, on the ground. Uh, all politics is local and we have to be able to support uh, the chapters and, that, and therefore that support will help us nationally. And I don't believe that we're communicating well and uh, as chair of chapter relations I'm working um, certainly with the advocacy office to develop communication plan and as president that would actually be a priority because I think that's where it begins. I, I feel I'm coming as an outsider somewhat but based on my communications in the state and talking with other uh, state leaders um, that I know. I feel that there, there really is too much space. I think it's something that, that's being worked on, but we certainly could do more. I think that in the future, um, the association and the state chapters should work in concert more on a lot of issues. Um, I, I feel like we're stronger together, absolutely. And truly, all politics are local politics at the end of the day. So any advocacy efforts that we're doing um, I think we need to keep that in mind, and I think that there needs to be overlap between what's happening at the state level and what's happening at, at, at the ALA level. 
So I'm all for increasing that pipeline through communications and um, drawing people into projects more. Thank you. We have two questions on the floor, uh, microphone three, microphone five. We're going to take both questions, and I'm going to ask each of the candidates to limit their responses to 60 seconds. Microphone three. Thank you. Um, I'm Joanna Orellana Cabrera, North Richland Hills Public Library. My question is directed um, to the presidential candidates. As a 20-something-year-old librarian of color in serving a second term on council, my concern for ALA is the representation of young librarians of color at leadership level. Um, when I look around the room, I don't see a lot of people that look like me. But we're the future of this profession. So my question to you is, if you are elected as president, what is sort of your succession plan to include more young librarians of color in leadership positions in ALA, I need like some kind of mentorship? Thank you. I truly believe that we need to provide a succession plan that offers a higher degree of engagement to young librarians of color to get them more involved at the leadership levels of this association. This association will be stronger by drawing in people from diverse backgrounds. And I feel like this is something the association's kind of fallen down on, and I would make it a priority to develop that succession plan to get more people involved. Thank you. So I certainly am a champion for librarians, library workers, especially librarians and library workers of color. I have been since I joined this profession. I think that what I have done is certainly champion and mentor librarians of color because I was champion and I was mentored. And without being a, having a champion, you're not going to be able to succeed and move up the ranks. And I, I know that's true. And that's been my experience. So what I, what I have done and what I will continue to do is have open dialogues and discussion. I, I, I think that uh, I only have 22 seconds, but and I can talk to you afterwards because this is something. We, we had a great program at JCLC, and I, I absolutely support the work of JCLC. And I hope that at, at conference we have an opportunity to have dialogue to find out at every conference, to hear from other librarians of color and, and, and all librarians how we can all work together to have a place for librarians of color in this association. Final question, microphone five. Aloha, I'm, Aloha, I'm Andrew Wertheimer, chapter counselor from Hawaii. We're really thrilled to see all of the attention on EDI initiatives, but another important thing for LIS is also intellectual freedom. And so I think it's been tradition to ask all of the candidates, are you a member of the Freedom to Read Foundation? So. Yes. 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 Right, you can uh, say more. Can I say more? <laughs> so, um, yes, I actually served on the Freedom to Read Foundation board for four years serving three of those years as president, and I still support the Freedom to Read Foundation. And every one of you should be members of the Freedom to Read Foundation. Check out the website, please. That completes our session on questions. Each candidate will now have two minutes to make a closing statement. We will begin with presidential candidate Lance Werner. Well, it's great to be with you again. Um, I got to tell you, this format something else. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating in this forum. I really appreciate your time. I want to take a moment to say that I'm honored to have the opportunity to run for the ALA presidency, and I want to thank Julius, Andrew, and Maggie for being up here with me today. Coming together to have really meaningful conversations about the future of ALA in our industry is where the rubber hits the road. This work cannot be done in, the va in a vacuum. I heard all your questions, and I take them very seriously, and I pledge to help. I will not forget them. My goal as ALA presidents is to be a catalyst for new opportunities to elevate the role of librarians. One of these opportunities, of course, 
is to help the new ALA director to be wildly successful, and I have, I have a background in that. But another is that we must be willing to partner with other organizations when it's mutually beneficial and there's a parallel mission addressing a common issue. Other opportunities revolve around being extremely proactive and visionary about the library industry. We can do just about anything, but we need to set a clear vision and strategy. It's the role of leadership to set the vision and strategy, and I'll do this by making sure that member voices are heard when making decisions and deciding direction, and two, by helping libraries gain a seat at the, a seat at the table by leveraging the greatest assets of kindness, empathy, and love. In closing, here's your takeaway. The president must be a servant leader. In addition to providing vision and direction, the president must be selfless and must do everything possible to make sure everyone is successful. I ask for your vote as ALA president, and I want to ask, when are we going to have a conference in Detroit? Thank you. So we are in a transformative, transformative period in ALA history that demands insightful and experienced leadership that will define our future as we face internal and external challenges. The president of ALA serves as the chief spokesperson for our association, presides over council, and presides over the executive board. I have had the pleasure of rising through the ranks of ALA with many of you in this room, participating in the conversations about where we need to go together as an association. I've served on and led ALA committees, presented programs nationally and locally that address the values of leadership, professional development, intellectual freedom, and diversity. I have served on council, participating in making ALA policy. And I was elected to serve on the ALA executive board, voting to move important issues like EDI as a part of our strategic directions. As your president, I will lead using my experience and knowledge of ALA to continue collaborating with ALA members, leaders, and staff to unite us as an association so together we will speak with one voice and be a strong modern library association for a modern profession. I ask that you elect me to be your 2021 ALA president. Thank you. Thank you again for your time today in discussing issues of paramount concern to our association. I'm honored to stand for election with Andrew Pace, and I want to publicly thank Andrew for his service to ALA, but also his collegial manner during the election. And just a note, Andrew and I are holding a joint reception at 6.30 in the Ballard Room. I hope that you can join us. We discussed a number of pressing issues for our association this afternoon, but underlying all of our work and, and underlying our initiatives is a sound financial structure. Our members expect and deserve wise management of our collective resources, that their financial and time investments are well managed to serve both the individual and collective goals of our association. While I can't predict our financial future, I have the willingness to work hard, to be open, to seek direction, to facilitate conversations, and to be accountable. I also have strong leadership and facilitation skills that will enable us to work together in order to support our mission. I bring expertise from my work through managing large budgets, in addition, I have direct ALA financial experience from serving in leadership positions and currently the chair of BARC. This prepares me to be your leader in overseeing the finances of the association. Thank you again. I ask for your vote as treasurer. Thank you once again to everyone in the room and the future watchers online if you're still with us after this long presentation. I don't have a whole lot to add to what's already been said. And if you'll forgive a small departure from humility, we should consider ourselves lucky as a volunteer membership organization to have four fine candidates for two very important offices of the association. Whatever the outcome of the election, I feel like ALA will be in good hands. Maggie, it's been a pleasure to run not against you, but with you for this important role. I've been a member of the ALA for over 25 years. After home and work, the association has often been my third place. 
It's where all my extra professional energy is spent. It's the organization, organization to which I feel a measure of devotion. Most importantly, it's where my friends are. I'm incredibly humbled by the support that so many of you have already shown me. Many of us see librarianship and library work as a calling. I've never considered another profession, and never have I felt more fulfilled professionally than in my work in ALA leadership. My term on the ALA Executive Board has been the most rewarding time of my entire tenure with ALA. But I also like to see things through. We are barely halfway across ALA's multi-channeled stream of change. Those waters can get tricky. I want to help the association navigate this crossing as its treasurer. It's the best way that I can think of to serve. I would be grateful for your support and your vote. Thank you. This concludes the 2019 ALA Midwinter Presidential and Treasurer Candidates Forum. It has been my pleasure to moderate this forum, and I will note that I stuck to the script. Um, I would like to thank our candidates and all of you who came to hear them and to question them. I would also like to strongly encourage you to vote this spring and to urge your fellow ALA members to vote as well. Electronic balloting will begin on March 11th and will close on April 3rd. The results of the election will be announced on April 10th. Thank you for coming. Have a good evening. <laughs>